There was cheering news and possibly a tiny ray of hope yesterday when it was announced that remdesivir, a drug formerly used to treat the Ebola virus disease, had relatively passed a clinical trial towards finding a medical solution to COVID-19. But while this development offers a glimmer of hope, questions are still being asked as to what could be the fate of humanity if the human body fails to develop a reasonable level of immunity towards what has proven to be the most destructive contagion in recorded history. Well, maybe in recent history, in the last 100 years, and with the Nigerian government's decision to throw caution to the winds and open up the country on May 4, the question of immunity to COVID-19 or a functional antibody to it has assumed even a more worrying dimension in this part of the world. And joining us now to help us get a perspective on all of this is Dr. Ernest Mwoke, a general medical practitioner, specialist in human physiology, and a senior lecturer at the College of Medicine, Ambrose Ali University, Epuma, Edo State, Nigeria, where he also teaches in the Department of Dietetics. Welcome to the program, doctor. Welcome Thank to the Thank you program, for joining doctor. us. Uh, welcome to the uh, morning show. Well, Dr. Mwoke, uh, we'll be uh, yeah. discussing uh, uh, a lot about immunity and uh, COVID-19 this morning. But I'd like to ask you, can you offer us a description of the interaction of uh, COVID-19 with the uh, immune system and the subsequent uh, uh, contribution of dysfunctional immune responses to the progression of the disease? Okay. Um, this particular virus is um, a unique virus in the sense that um, it's not been coded before now. It's not been in the archives. It's not been in the, in the research scope before now. Uh, before now, six types of um, coronavirus had been documented, but it came as the seventh. And coming now, it came with a lot of arsenal. Well, I'd like to let you know that Virus, as an organism, is a very unique type of microorganism. Most of them make use of the host, the host machinery to survive and thrive and to progress. And it is that progress that gives you the ability to infect from person to person. This particular virus has this genome, an RNA genome, which is unique, a five prime methylated cap and a three prime polyadenylated tail. And it uses this tail to hook to the host ribosome. It uses this tail to hook to the host ribosome and in the host ribosome, it translates and in the process of translation, it employs an enzyme called RNA-dependent RNA polymerase in the process of transcription. And in this process of transcription, it gains, after gaining access into the host cell, it becomes very infected. And in that infection, it takes over the host apparatus. And when it does this, it localizes to the respiratory system. And then um, the host immunity is supposed to attack it as a foreign agent. The host immunity is supposed to attack it and localize it and expunge it, terminate it, and do away with it. But because it has identified with the host system, it looks like a member of the normal community. And in that way, it just goes wild in the host system. That is the reason why it can kill so fast. It actually overwhelms the host immunity and takes over the host system, shutting down the respiratory apparatus and bringing about respiratory arrest, which to be attended by a lot of other organ, organ, organ failures. And that is how the virulence comes to be. 
Dr. Anwake, However, I, sorry, do go on, Doctor. Yeah. However, this particular attitude of COVID-19 has never been as perfectly manifested by other COVID, um, that's coronavirus for now. That is why all the studies made of all other coronavirus before now, the MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus, the SARS, SARS-1, this is SARS-2, SARS-CoV-2, all they've learned from the others could not help in SARS-CoV-2, which is the COVID-19, because it came with its own unique peculiar amyuri. So it's a problem that looks like something new in the world. But I, 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 I beg to say that um, it's not new in the world. There has been SARS-CoV-1. This is just the arrival of SARS-CoV-2. And why the world did not prepare for such an emergence is what still baffles me till now. Thank you. Certainly, Doctor, it is baffling, especially when you look back at reports that we're all seeing now, with a lot of medical experts across the world warning us that a pandemic was on the way if we were not careful. Now, I want to speak to you about the way in which the vaccine trials are currently going on, because genetic engineering is currently being used to try and find a vaccine to, uh, SARS, for SARS-CoV-2. I beg my pardon. Uh, sorry, beg me. Pardon me. And um, this is quite weird because normally we've, we've seen traditional approaches being used for influenza vaccines over the past 70 years rather than genetic engineering. Now, if this goes through and if this happens, this is also going to be the first genetically engineered vaccine to be approved for human use. There have been many that have been created, but none have been approved for human use. Even the Ebola vaccine took about five years to create. Are you hopeful that this vaccine is going to be out by 2021, as experts are coming out to say? Um, well, thank you very much for that question. Believe me, I'm not very hopeful. I'm sorry to say. I'm not very hopeful because um, the, the world had decades to prepare for 2019. Take it from me. There was a novel I saw online, and that novel talked about a Wuhan 400 virus that plagued the world and produced a pandemic of, an, of unseen proportion. And this novel was written as far back as 1984. Why the world did not really put in more into preparing for this pandemic is something that matters me, but I think it has to do with the fact that the world easily forgets. Uh, well, the last of such kind of very um, uh, gangantuan pandemic, which is almost looked like a pandemic of biblical proportion, was in the 1918s, 1918, 1919, 1920, uh, when you had the Spanish flu. Well, I think it was dealt with what they call dust and dust then, but nothing really was learned from it. And going into history right now, I'm so surprised that nothing really was learned from the Spanish flu. Well, the genetically engineered vaccine that they're talking about right now, believe me, it's going to take more than that time, and they know. They know, if you see some countries like America and some European countries are now talking about testing their citizens for innate immunity. Innate immunity, that's their ability to generate defense, antibodies against this coronavirus. Because they know that that is the fastest and that is natural. That was given by the almighty from above. So this genetically engineered um, uh, vaccine, well, we're watching, we're praying that it works. Um, Bill Gates and Melinda Gates and a lot of other uh, what of philanthropists, a lot of governments. In short, there is a mad rush. There is a sprint for who would generate it first. We hear about um, some drugs like uh, remdesivir being tried. We have a, we hear about a lot of other drugs being tried. But I have a unique perspective to how this particular um, pandemic will be handled, especially in Africa and Nigeria to be particular. Thank you. But Dr. Nwoke, quickly, I mean, uh, if you look at the uh, fatality rates um, with regard to COVID-19, there seems to be a marked difference between males and females. Uh, in one report, it was said for males, uh, fatality rate is about 2.8 percent. For females, it's about 1.7 percent. And even here in Lagos State, uh, Dr. Abayomi, the Commissioner for Health, 
had provided statistics along those lines. Now, are there differences in sex hormones, um, estrogen for women, testosterone uh, for men, that influence uh, disease severity or, you know, the uh, response, immunity response to COVID-19? Oh, cool. thank you so much. Well, I'd like to say this categorically. The life of any man is about the metabolism of that man. The susceptibility to disease of anybody has a lot to do with the metabolic integrity, metabolic state, metabolic orientation, metabolic disposition of that particular man. Well, yes, like you're talking about trying to reference it now to testosterone for men, estrogen for women. Well, I normally tell my students testosterone is actually the hormone that was put in us for the aggressions of life. And like, of course, it's expected that the, the man should go out, do all it takes to bring the bacon home, defend the family and do every other thing. So testosterone is, to me, very, very um, susceptible. And well, if you know, naturally, naturally, let me bring it up. Naturally, men die faster than women. I think you know that. Uh, for a lot of reasons, men die faster than women. But in this case, this disease does a lot with the rate of metabolism. It's, it's surprising to me that the world has not started looking in that direction to look at the interaction of this COVID-19 virus with the metabolic state of the individual. Like you will know, Africa has the tropical Africa and the temperate Africa. I heard uh, figures being reeled out. Egypt, um, uh, Egypt 5,000, uh, whatever, then, um, what do you call it, Algeria, 5,000 deaths, um, South Africa, 5,000 leading the park. If you check, these countries are the tip of Africa in the temperate regions of Africa. And in those areas, metabolism tends to be slower. Now, for males, the testosterone subjects them to more exaggerated um, metabolism, and that more exaggerated metabolism, when it's altered, produces marked alteration to life. Mark you, this particular virus affects and alters the most key, the most key aspect of our existence, which is our respiration. Talking to you right now. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nwoke. There is certainly a lot to learn about COVID-19 and immunological responses. Thank you very much indeed.